us and ensnares us. I just had this picture this morning of just this sludge that we were in, just this, this, this goo, this mud. You know, I love in Psalm 63 where it says, he, he pulled me up out of the miry clay. It might have been Psalms 46. But he sets our feet out of, out of, whoa, out of the mud, and he sets our feet on the rock. He sets our feet on a rock as we, as we come out. And Hebrews is telling us to lay aside every weight, every, all the sludge, all the entanglements, everything that keeps us from running with energy and running with endurance. I just want to pray as we open up these scriptures. Father, we thank you that it's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom tonight. Lord, we thank you that you want us to run with energy, to run the long race, the race of endurance. We thank you that you've given us a model. You've given us faithful ones, the cloud of witnesses that we're surrounded by, even this moment, even tonight, that we are surrounded by them, and they're looking upon us. They're looking for our response to your word and to the prophetic moment that we're living in. Father, we ask you for a grace, Lord, to come upon our lives that we would run this race with endurance in Jesus' name. So we're, we're laying these things aside, and we don't only, only look at our heroes, but we look unto Jesus. Verse number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. I love this scripture right here. Here, if, if you're feeling discouraged tonight, if you're feeling discouraged any moment in your life, here is like the pill to take when that happens. You, you meditate and you consider. Don't just consider it and just be like, oh yeah, I considered that. Like consider it, like weigh it out. Litany by litany, everything that Jesus walked through, every, every nail in his hand, every, every thorn on the crown, every scourge of his back, every mockery, every spit that was, every ounce of spit that was spit upon him by soldiers, the, the robe and, and, and the carrying and the mocking of the, 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 um, the road that he carried the cross on, the shame of being naked, it says that he, he despised the shame and became shame on the cross. Like, consider that. Meditate on that. Anytime you're discouraged or become weary in your souls, this is something that we can meditate on. So we think about the heroes and all that they endured for the promises that they didn't even fully see. And then we look at Jesus, the, one, the mighty one, the, the one with the most courage and the most strength. And when we feel like our souls are weary and we're out of strength, when we feel discouraged, like somebody sapped all the courage out of us, we look at the man with more courage than any man that's ever walked the earth. And all the sudden adrenaline starts to revitalize us and renew us and there's a spiritual vitality that comes back to our lives when we meditate upon these things. We're not going to find the peace and the rest and the energy in checking out in vacation, although that's good. We're not going to find the rest and the energy and the, the recuperating, the renewing of, of doing certain things or doing what the world does. We find it when we meditate on the heroes of faith and when we look upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He initiated this thing called the kingdom. He started this thing. When he comes onto the earth, he says, the kingdom is now manifested upon you. The kingdom is now here. It's not yet completely, but it's here in baby form. It's ruling and reigning wherever the king is king. The kingdom is there ruling and reigning. And this gives us courage and it gives us strength. And when we become weary and discouraged, we meditate upon these things. Then it says this, Remember that you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So we look back at verse 1 of Hebrews 12, and it says, Let, lay aside all of the sin. Lay aside all of the weight of that sin and all of that sin. And then it reminds us that you didn't resist sin yet unto the shedding of blood. You know who knows the most about the power of sin is the one who has been tempted to the nth degree and has resisted it completely. If you give into sin immediately, you don't know how powerful it is. You just gave right into it. If you resist that for a day, then you know how powerful it is. If you resist it for two days and three days and for a lifetime, if you're like Jesus and you resisted temptation for your entire life so that you lived your life perfectly righteous and pure, 
then you know the power of sin more than anybody. There is not a man on this earth who cannot relate to the, t- the power of temptation in your life more than Jesus can. And we say, well, Jesus didn't have any of these thoughts. Oh, yeah? I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm morbid, but I, I, I think Jesus had some crazy temptations. We know of three of them, but I think... I think this man resisted everything. He had the power to manipulate people. He had the power to use women. He had the power to to take money. He had the power to, to do all the things that we in our darkness and in our sin would do, but Jesus resisted it all. You see, we, we forget that he was fully man. He had needs. He 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 was nursed by his mother. He had to be fed. He was, a, he was a real man. He had complete needs of every other human being. But he resisted all of the temptation. He resisted all of the sin. He lived righteously and purely. He was born pure by a virgin conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was purely born. But not only that, he then lived his life purely and righteously so that he could be the appropriation. He could be the, 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 the sacrifice, the pure sacrifice, the offering, the redemption that, was, that our sins cost. And so we have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. We haven't been tempted so much that we've resisted that far, that we've suffered over the resisting of our temptation. Who's like Jesus? There's no one like our Lord. There's no one like this man. And then it says this, And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord love, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. I don't believe that we have a proper conception of discipline in the church. We should be the most disciplined people on the earth. If God is our Father and we walk as sons and the identity of sons, we should be the most disciplined people on the earth. Now, there's a warning here to not take God's discipline lightly and to not be overwhelmed by it, to not take it too heavily. So we have to walk this narrow path, this tension of discipline from our Father. And that tension is right inside of our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts man of sin and he leads us. And we have to be acutely aware to this tension of discipline from our Father. And we should want this. We want this because this makes us legitimate sons. If you are under God's discipline in your life, then you are a legitimate son. If you are outside of discipline, if nothing pricks you, if if the fear of God or or the conviction of sin does not prick your heart, then your heart is disconnected from the Father. Your heart is not near the Father. There's a disconnect between son and father and your illegitimate sons. I want to talk to you tonight, and, and this is maybe my main point here, is that it's not in our physical senses, but it's in the quiet, invisible space that we hear God's voice, and it renews our spiritual energy so that we can worship Him, accept so that he accepts our worship, so he receives our worship. Another way you could think of it is so that your life is worthy of who Jesus is. Let me, let, me, let me unpack that. It's not in your physical senses. It's not in looking at other people's lives. It's not in what you think and condemnations in your voice, in your head. It's not any of those things. It's in the, the, the quiet space within your spirit, man, the quiet space where God's voice speaks. It's not in your feel. It's deeper than feelings. It's deeper than thoughts. His spirit is deeper than those things. It's not in those physical senses. It's in the, in the space, the invisible space of your spirit where we hear God's voice. And in that place of hearing God's voice, we are renewed. Our spiritual energies are renewed. Man does not live by bread alone. He lives by the voice of God. 
And we have to sensitize our hearts to that voice. It's not in our thoughts. It's not in our feelings. It's not in looking at one another and how they're living their life and how they're living their life and judging who we are in comparison to these people and that people. It's not about any of that. It's in the still, quiet space in your spirit, man, where you hear God's voice, where you are renewed to life again and where the energy of God comes into your life and you can live a life worthy of him. This is so important to the Father that you are connected to this sensitivity, that he will take us through discipline to keep us connected and sensitive to this. This is where the Father's love comes because he disciplines us out of love. He doesn't discipline us out of punishment. All of the Father's discipline is for restoration. It's always to restore us back to, I want your heart to be this alive and this sensitive to my spirit that I can direct you in the way that you go so that I can be with you always. And so when his discipline comes, it's because we're missing out on that. His discipline comes in sinful areas because it's not the sin that he hates. It's that it disconnects us from that sensitivity and from that place of hearing his voice and being connected to his son. This is why the father loves to discipline his sons. This is why the ones that he disciplines are the sons of his love. We have a a misconception of discipline. We think it's punishment. We think it's we, we, get, we, we don't even like the, the words as law, these words law, like in the church. I don't know why we don't like law. I, I always hear people say, I'm free from the law. I was free from the law before I came to know the Lord. I did whatever the heck I wanted to do. We're not free from the law. We're free from the punishment of the law. But the law of the Spirit is higher than the law of Moses. And what should be ruling and reigning in our hearts is the still small voice of the Holy Spirit that leads his sons. Romans 8 says that for as many as our sons are led by the Holy Spirit. This is something that's so important to us and I believe the Father wants us to get this so much because he is a trainer. The Father is like the best initiator. He's always initiating and training and developing and and raising up sons and daughters. He does it better than anybody. Jesus can take some entrepreneurs who have a fishing business. He can take some corrupt tax collectors, and he initiates them, and he trains them into being sons of God. God's the best trainer. And if we're doing this right, we can learn to cooperate with God and see ourselves restored When we get interrupted and off course, how many of you know we're going to get interrupted? We're going to get off course. It so easily ensnares us. It so easily weighs us down. It's going to happen. We're going to get off course. But what God wants to do is he wants to be able to teach us, renew us back into course, bring us back into course. It's called correction. It's called rebuke. It's called uh, instruction. It's called discipline. It's called uh, rehabilitation. These things aren't bad things. We think if they're happening to us, we're in bad shape. I want to tell you, if they're not happening to you, you're in bad shape. Because we we constantly are getting off course. God wants to initiate us and, and keep us on course. And if we're doing it right, we can cooperate with the Lord. And he will restore ourselves back to spiritual sensitivity, back to spiritual energy. And we won't be discouraged and weary. We'll be running the race with endurance. With God, we don't have to figure this thing out, start running, mess up, and then say, God, where are you? Like, come help me where I went. He wants to run it with us and be so sensitive to our hearts and our hearts so sensitive to his that we're cooperating with these things. And when we get really good at doing it for ourselves, God's going to use us to help other people. Because if you can lead yourself and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, you can lead other people and help them yield to the Holy Spirit. God's creating us all to be leaders, to restore people who are off course, to restore people who are discouraged and and weary, and teach them how to resist sin, teach them how to receive God's discipline, which is good for us. Discipline is maybe the best way to think about it is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, it's you think of like if your arm's broken and you have to get it realigned and put back together and rehabilitated. That's what God's discipline is. It's not to break. He doesn't break your arm off. Your arm's broken and he puts it back together and he rehabilitates it so that you can use it. 
I'm not just making this up. This is right here in Hebrews. Let's check this out. So if you endure ch chastening, God's dealing with you as sons, verse 7, verse 8. But if you're without chastening or without correction, without discipline, then you are illegitimate and you're not sons. Furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. How much more readily should we be in subjection to the Father of spirits? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them, but for our profit that we may become partakers of his holiness. Now no correction, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present. Nobody likes discipline in the moment, right? It's not fun in the present moment. It's not cheerful, it's painful, it's not joyful. But nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of, the right, of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What does that mean? Verse 11, it basically means those who are trained by discipline receive the peace and confidence that comes through their relationship with the Father from the discipline that brought them to a place of righteousness. So let me explain that. Righteousness, when you're righteous, you stand before the Lord in confidence and in peace. You're no longer at war with God. You're no longer an enemy with God. Your righteousness brings you to a place of coming boldly before the throne. And it's not your righteousness, it's your righteousness because of Jesus in Jesus. So that righteousness puts you into a peaceful relationship with the Father. I know he's not gonna beat the crap out of me. I know he's not gonna punish me. I'm standing before him. I know his love for me. I know that I'm a son. There's peace now between me and the Father. And I get to enjoy that peace because discipline came into my life and brought me to a place of righteous living. That's why we want to welcome discipline because the fruit of discipline is peace with the Father. This is good stuff. Like, we want discipline. We shouldn't shy away from discipline because what discipline brings to our lives is peace and confidence to live before the Father. It brings us into right relationship. We're no longer at war with God. I no longer know that I'm living in sin and that God has to deal with my sin and I have to put Jesus back up on the cross again and all the things that we come before the Lord. We let God train us and we let him discipline us so that we can receive the joy and the peace and the confidence of being in relationship with him. Now, discipline isn't fun in the moment, but I want the fruit of it. If discipline was fun in the moment, if being disciplined was fun, none of us would have problems doing it, right? Because you have to do something painful. That's what discipline is. It's, it's doing something you don't want to do. If, you, if doing what you wanted to do ended in good stuff, then you wouldn't need discipline, right? So discipline is putting off what you want in the moment. It's putting off what is easy for you. It's putting off what satisfies you, and it's putting on what God wants, where God's leading you, what God's saying, and that over and over again creates fruit in your life of peace with God. We can live, we can live with God. Isn't, that's like, we can live with God. That's what Jesus came to teach us, is that I, I came to teach you and bring you life and bring you abundant life. See, he said the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came so that you can live with God. This is what living with God is. This is, this, this is what, what, what is so amazing about it. Discipline. I want, I want us to just love discipline. Like, we just got to love it. And if, and if we don't love it, there's reasons, all sorts of reasons for that. There's pride. We think we got to show God that we can get it together without his discipline. There's rebellion. There's sin, hidden sin. There's misconceptions of who God is, that he's an angry God and that he wants to punish us. There's all sorts of things that play into why we wouldn't love discipline. Nobody loves it for the moment, but I love the fruit of it. I love the confidence that I can walk in before the Lord now. I love that I don't have to be anxious about what people think about me because I know what my God thinks about me. I love that that I know that I can come before the Lord and I don't have to have all this weight and, and sin that's just regret and all this stuff just kind of weighing in the back of my head and being like, God, I know people say you love me, but do you really love me? I love the fruit that comes through discipline. The cleanness and the purity and the, the clear thinking that comes to our lives. The vision that comes when we live discipline. You know, scripture says that 
without vision, people cast off discipline. And so when we live this life and we let God discipline us, we start to see where we're going. We start to see, we're, we're now, not only are we not in the sludge anymore, not only are we not entangled and weighed down, but we're actually running and we're seeing where we're running to. Now that's life. And that's life abundantly. So then it goes on and says, and this, I want to pick up here. We're going to camp out here for a little bit. We're going to go through all, this is crazy, guys. This is crazy. We're going to go through 29 ver verses. Verses? Yeah. We're in chapter 12, and we're going through 29 verses. All right, let's pick it up at verse number 12. So now, because we want this fruit, how many of you want the fruit of peace with God? So you're saying, okay, I'm signing up. God, initiate me. Discipline me. Sensitize me fresh tonight. My heart, sensitize it to your spirit. Wherever you're leading me, all those, I don't want to be numb to the little pricks of the heart that's just disciplining me, right? So I want the peace of standing before the Lord and having righteousness and relationship with him. I want that fruit. And so therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Remember I was talking to you about the arm, the broken arm? God's not breaking our arm. He's looking to heal lame things. There's a warning in here, though. If you don't cooperate with that, things will be dislocated. That's why Jesus says it's better to cut your arm, off, your hand off and get into the kingdom, right, than it is to sin. So it's like we can, like this is the way I'm seeing it. It's like, guys, we can do this now. We can live this life under God's discipline, under his leading, under his rehabilitation, under his discipleship, and we can get healed up, restored, and start running now. And we can make, like the picture I get is I, I get all in. I don't show up without a piece of me. Like I get, we, we get all in on this thing. Every part of us gets into the kingdom because we don't want anything to be dislocated. So let's look at this. Therefore, because God loves us as sons, he disciplines us. And strengthen the hands. Make your hands stronger. They hang down. They're, you know, um, in the message version, it says that your hands are relaxed. We can't have this relaxed attitude about our relationship with God. We have to strengthen our hands. Having done all the stand, stand. We have to strengthen our hands and strengthen our feet, right? Strengthen the feeble knees. You know, the feeble knees, that gives us pictures of lacking strength so that we can walk. And God's not just calling us to walk. He's calling us to run. So he's saying, strengthen the hands. Strengthen the feeble knees, the weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet. Build something that's not bent or curved so that you can walk and run on it. How many of you want a life that's just straight, that you can just run on it, that there's a path in front of you and there's a road and you understand the road and there's the obstacles are starting to move away because you're walking in a place of discipline and you're just, you're set on it and you're ready to run with endurance and you're ready to set the pace and you're not going to get tripped up and you're not going to get entangled and there's not weights that are going to get down on you, but you're just going to start going. Well, God's saying, strengthen the hands, strengthen the feeble knees, build a life for yourself where you're making straight paths for yourself. This is ownership of, of us. See, and I, I'm, I'm waiting for revival, and we can sit here and tarry and wait for God to do it, but I also think God's looking to partner with us to build a life of revival. He's looking for us to partner with us to build a straight life so that we can call people from that road and say, come, follow us. Let us show you the one who can restore you, who can take the lame and make him walk, and not just walk, but run, and not just run, run with endurance and not weighed down. A life of spiritual uh, vitality, a life of energy, energy and strength. This is what God's calling us to. Make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated. See, what is unable to walk because of illness may not be forced out of, out of position. Let me explain this. God wants you to cooperate with him to rehabilitate parts of your life so that they're not forced to be dislocated. God doesn't want to force something on you. He's inviting you to cooperate with him to restore things and to put things back together 
so that he doesn't have to force things to be dislocated. I just have this picture of parts not getting in to heaven, not, not getting into life with God. We can, we can live this and just, no. That's, that needs to be pruned. That is not bearing any fruit. And so I'm cutting that thing off. And God's saying, the Father's saying, I want to correct, I want to be in a relationship with you where I can, I can, I can tell you what's going on. I can discipline you. I can say something to you and it has some weight to it and you start to shape up and build something around yourself and you start to come clean on some stuff. I want to have a relationship with you where I can be honest with you. I don't want to have to force things or dislocate things. I want to heal things. I want to restore things. I want to take what's lame and, and, and restore it and heal it. Look at this. But rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people. Pursue holiness. That's peace with God. Right? So we have, as we partner with this discipline, look what starts to happen with our lives. First, we start to see peace with all people. I'm telling you, folks, relational relational immaturity or relational problems that you have, relationship what am I trying to say? Relational dysfunction is connected to our spiritual life. Like our emotional maturity is connected to our spiritual maturity. We can't be dysfunctional all over here with all these humans and then think that we can just have this clear-cut, straight path to a relational God. Your skills should be transcending these two realms. Relationships on earth, relationship in heaven. Like, there's things that are connected there. And so, peace with all people and holiness. Pursue peace with all people. And what I get out of that is start having some healthy relationships with people and watch how healthy your relationship gets with God. Holiness. Peace with people. To me, holiness is peace with God. It's back to that thing. I want the fruit of peace with God. I want to be able to relate to God. I want, I want to be able to hear God. I want to not just be in my own little echo chamber where I only hear what I want to hear. And that's why my relationships aren't working out because I'm not taking cues and I'm not getting feedback and information from people. I'm not sensitive to what's going on in other people's relationships. So now I'm not sensitive to what the Father's saying back to me. All I am is noise and I'm walking around and there's really no connection to anybody. And God's calling us to something greater than that. Life and life abundantly should look like peace with people and peace with God, holiness with God. And we're to pursue that pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord think of blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God God's looking to bring us to a place of purity he's looking to bring us through his discipline to a place of purity and holiness you with me where are we verse 15 awesome now this is awesome, look at this. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. That means live deliberately, live intentionally. Look carefully, care about your life. Look, look at your life so that you don't fall short of the grace of God. Now we could read this in one way. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. So we can say, I'm looking at you to make sure nobody's falling short of the grace of God. But I think it starts with looking carefully at your life. It's like Jesus said, don't look at the speck in somebody else's eye when you got a plank in your own eye. It always starts with eye. Look carefully at your life, deliberately and intentionally. Take a inventory of your life, of your thoughts, of your words, of your relationships. Look carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this, many become defiled. Look at this. This is so awesome. 
if we look carefully at our lives, we can uproot bitterness out of our lives and we can affect other people in a positive way. He's saying if you, if you don't do this, it's going, a root of bitterness is going to grow up inside of you. It's going to cause a whole bunch of trouble and not just trouble for you, but it's actually going to defile other people. I don't know if you've ever been on the receiving end of a root of bitterness. I don't know if you've ever been poisoned or defiled by somebody else's root of bitterness. You know, we say, we say it like this, hurt people, hurt people. But God's saying, look carefully at your life, lest you fall short of the grace of God. What's that grace? The grace is the power to help you live holy, peaceful, pure, righteous lives. God's grace isn't just here to save us out of hell. It's to show us how to live in this life a holy and righteous life. I love in Titus 2, it says that the grace has appeared to all men and it teaches us. It disciplines us. It trains us. It initiates us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. That's what grace does. See, we love the grace for the gifts. We love the grace of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We love the grace of the miracles and all that. But do you know that that same grace that can raise people from the dead, the same grace that speaks prophetically in meetings and in your life and gives you a word of knowledge for your waitress, the same grace is in your life to purify you as a pure and spotless bride for Jesus. The same grace is in you to give you power over sin in your life. Somewhere along the lines, I think we, there's something that snuck in and we begin to believe that, that, that there always will be, you know, this thorn in our flesh. That there will always be this issue that's just always nagging us. I love Pastor Jim's teaching on that. The thorn in the flesh isn't actually a sin issue. The thorn in the flesh is accusations about Paul's ministry. So everywhere he goes, people accuse him and, and, and slander him, and he ends up in jail and all of these things. That's not a sin issue on his part. God's calling us to such high purity and high righteousness. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this may be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. This is one of the things I'm very concerned about in the church is this issue right here. Fornicators and profane people like Esau who for a morsel of food sell their birthright. There is sexual issues in the church that we are not addressing. There's sexual perversion. There's a, there's a lawlessness to our lives when it comes to sexual purity. That's no different than the first century church when he's talking about fornicators and profane people. We have to address this. The statistics are staggering. And I'm not talking from a place of judgment. I'm talking from a place of, I get it. I was a statistic. I was addicted to, to, to stuff. I was, I was in a life that, was, that so easily ensnared me and tangled me up. And we got to get out of this. We got to raise a standard of sexuality in the church. We have to raise a standard of purity in the church. And we can't be shouting at the world. The world has been the same and it always will be the same. But God within his bride and within his church, within his family, has a standard of purity that we can rise up to and that we can live in and that we can challenge each other with and challenge ourselves with unashamedly. That we can look people in the face and say sin is sin and it's wrong. And that doesn't mean you're bad, but that means it's taking you on a trajectory in your life that I promise you, you do not want to go down. And we can look at people and talk about sin and still look at people and say, but I see something better in you. I see a way of living. I, I can show you it. I'm not just talking about ideas. I can actually be an example to you. I can show you how it's done. I can, I can impart grace into your life to combat this level of sin in your life. That's where we got to get to. I'm passionate about this because this is an issue of seeing God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We have a whole generation in the church that is anesthetized and numb to the, to the, the presence and the awareness of God because there's a, a, a veil of sexual perversion that is blinding the eyes of the saints of God from seeing Jesus in all of his beauty and all of his glory. We 
And we all need to carefully consider our lives lest any of us fall short of the grace of God. I'm really preaching to myself tonight. I hope, I hope I'm not coming across angry. I'm passionate about this issue. I'm passionate about the Father being known as a good discipler, as someone who disciplines his sons really well and it's a sign of his love. I'm passionate about the church coming into a place of order that we wouldn't be known for our wild living and our holy talking, but there would be a connection between our lives and our words, that our actions and our words would be integrated together so that we would be a living carnation of the man who walked purely on this earth. A man who, when he spoke, his words pushed men back because he had so much weight to his life and force to his life that it cuts men's heart. That people that talked about religious things oohed and awed, and they said, who is this one who says the stuff we say, but he says it with authority? That's what I'm passionate for the church to have. Because I'm looking at a generation of young people who have been discipled by Netflix sexuality. They've been discipled by Instagram. They've been discipled by YouTube and the culture of this age. And we can't just look down at the next generation and see that this, this has been defiled many over generations. And we can compare to the 60s and we can compare to the, the, the roaring 20s and 30s and we can compare to whatever. It's the same thing that's coming generation to generation as defiling many. And God's raising up a standard and he's calling us to look carefully at ourselves lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble and problems and defile many people. Lest there be a fornicator or, or a profane person like Esau who for a morsel of food sold his birthright, for a mouthful, for a bite, for a taste of something, sold his birthright. And my concern is that there's, there's people in the church that have a birthright because they've called on the name of Jesus, but for a taste of something, they've sold their birthright. They've sold their, 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 their co-heirship with Jesus, and instead of being ruling and reigning with Jesus, they're no more than a slave. And we have to, it, it starts with us. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about us. What can we do? What kind of discipleship can we come under so that when we're talking to somebody, we have the ability to restore them so that we actually have the gift to, of, of taking lame people spiritually and bringing them upright and bringing them to spiritual vitality so that they can walk and run. If we're not running ourselves, this is something that has to hit home to us so that we can be mothers and fathers to a generation and teach them, not by words, but by example, by being the incarnation of being. I'm so familiar, like Jesus, I'm so familiar with the power of temptation. I've resisted it far, and I'm telling you that you can run this race. That you can lay this aside. You can become untangled by this thing. I, I've done the work with the Holy Spirit in my life. I've uprooted the bitterness in my life. And I'm here to, to offer you kingdom. I'm here to offer you life and power to live purely. And look at this. This is what I'm so concerned about. I have two slides that we're going to end with. I don't know how we're going to end. Hold on. So Hebrews goes on, and it, it says all this stuff, guys. It's crazy. I, I've been st studying and reading it like crazy. But Hebrews 12 just continues on with all this stuff. And it, it talks about going to the material mountain. I'm just going to try and sum this up. So he says, you didn't go to a mountain. Can we get, where, can we get those next couple verses, the mountain verses? Um... For you have not come to the mountain, verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that be touched and burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempt us to the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore because they couldn't endure it. Even beasts couldn't touch it. So terrifying that 
Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. So we didn't come to this material mountain. We didn't come, and this is my point, we didn't come to the senses. We didn't come to the five senses that we can see and that we can touch. We came to the Mount Zion. It's this space that's within ourselves that God speaks into. It's, it, we came to a living God, it says. You came to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, surrounded by an innumerable company of angels, surrounded by the general assembly. Remember, Hebrews 11, we're surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, surrounded by the firstborn who were registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all people, to the spirits of just made men perfect, to Jesus, Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood that speaks a better word than Abel. This is what we've come to. This is what our hearts can come to. And I, I'm praying tonight that that blood hits our hearts, that the mediator Jesus speaks to our hearts, that the Father, the judge of all spirits, speaks to our hearts and begins to, to prick our hearts again and call us to, to be careful about our lives and to, and to uh, look at our lives lest we fall from the grace of God. This is what we've come to, that voice that can speak to us and lead us into rehabilitation and lead us into renewing our spirit and renewing energy so that we can run with endurance. We didn't come to a material mountain. We came to the city of our living God. So therefore, do not refuse the one who speaks. This is where I'm preaching to myself tonight. It's so easy to refuse the one who speaks. I heard Derek Prince say one time, he goes, it's hard to hear God's voice because he requires something of us. When we come to that place of communion with him, when he starts to speak to us, when he starts to, to share things with us and share his heart with us, it, it leaves us, it should leave us in a place like Nehemiah where we can't just hear about something and talk about something and see something, but we have to do something. And so therefore, do not refuse the one who speaks. Let's just close our eyes. We welcome the one who speaks. We as a people, come on, let's do church right now. When we, two or three are agreed on earth, it will be done in heaven. We welcome the one who speaks. To this community, to the tabernacle, to eagle's wings, to our families and to our homes, we welcome the voice of the living God. We welcome to the judge of all spirits, we welcome the voice of Jesus, the mediator. We welcome the blood that speaks. We won't refuse the one who speaks, Lord, here in this place. If you agree, just begin to just pray out and say amen. We welcome the voice of the living God tonight. Into our hearts, come and prick our hearts, Father. Come and instruct us. Come discipline us. Come love us the way that you love us. Come restore things that are out of place so that we can live with confidence before you. Lord, I thank you for the blood that speaks a better word. The blood that cries out mercy. So let's look at this as we close. I want to show you the, the pathway of the root of bitterness. The pathway of bitterness grows in a certain, a certain direction. So it starts as a seed bitterness. It's like a baby. It's immature, and it starts to, to grow up. And, and if it, you have to be, remember back to that verse. Um, Lord, help me. Um, looking carefully. You have to be careful because this thing will start to grow. It's like a weed. You, you stop looking at your garden for a day or two days, and before you know it, this thing is starting to grow. And so it's like a baby. It's in seed form. It's immature, and then it starts to sprout, which is like a symbol of adolescence and prematurity, and it's starting to, to gain some strength. It's getting a little bit more of a hold on, on the ground and on you, and then it grows up into its mature root form, and before you know it, this thing has a root inside of you, which means this bitterness has attached itself to you and is now bearing fruit in your life, and Scripture says it begins to defile other people. And it starts off the seed form of this thing. And this is why it's so hard to be carefully looking at yourself lest you fall from, from grace. It starts off as just a little disappointment. 
a little disappointment in God, a little disappointment in someone you love, a little disappointment in a, in, in a, a, a child, a little disappointment in a spouse, a little disappointment in an authority figure or a pastor or a boss. It's just a little disappointment. Unmet expectations. And then it starts to grow and it turns into discontent. You start to think, well, grass is greener on the other side or starts starting to look a little bit better over there. It's, or, or discontent is like you start looking at somebody else's sin and you're just comparing yourself. You're like, well, it's not as bad as that. And you start to weigh these things out and you're a little discontent with this growing seed. And then it turns into discouragement where it begins to, to you lose strength and dread starts to, 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 to grow into it. And then it, it matures into doubt. You start to become cynical. It starts to sprout into disbelief. You start to waver in believing. This is the state, this is the second stage of doubt. This is doubt like just planted a little bit deeper, disbelief. It's unbelief. You're not quite sure anymore. You, you're disbelieving it, and it turns into disillusionment, which conviction now is, is starting to wane. Conviction is gone. It's not so bad. It's not as bad as somebody else. I'm in a better place now in my life than I was 10 years ago, so it's not so bad. You start to get disillusioned. You start to make exceptions for whatever's going on. You start to, the light is dimming. The light's going off. And disillusionment will grow into deception. It's the belief of a lie. The light in that particular area is gone. And this is what's so crazy about this stuff is because this can be in one area of our lives. We can be living this whole other life, and in one area of our life, the light can be off. And we can be so disappointed, and so discontent, and so discouraged, and doubting, and disbelieving, and so disillusioned that we begin to be deceived. The light is gone in that area. And that leads to disobedience. At this point, we're no longer submitting. We're insubordinate. The voice of the Spirit that wants to speak to us in that area and wants to be Lord of that area is not Lord anymore. Premature. Adolescence. Kind of is a good description of adolescence, isn't it? And that thing begins to take root. And not only is it just personal disobedience, but as that thing matures, it becomes corporate disobedience. Now your disappointment has grown to a place of discord where you're out of order and you're affecting other people. You're causing other people to stumble and causing other people to be disappointed and to, and to, and, and, and to uh, be discontent. And that discord grows into dysfunction. This is that thing that we talked about where it's disjointed. It's disconnected. It's not functioning right. And where the writer in Hebrews is saying, when, the, it, it, and guys, we get off track. That's the whole point of why Hebrews is saying this in verse 12. It's like, here's the way to get back on track. So if you're finding yourself here somewhere, there's good news. If you're feeling yourself under God's discipline right now, there's good news. That is a confirmation that you're a son and you're still sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, it, and God's saying, I want to repair that thing. And that dysfunctional thing is disconnected, and that disconnection turns into despair. You know why it's despair right there? And you, you think maybe despair would have been earlier? Because when you're disconnected from people, from the body, and you're alone, that's despair. That's loneliness. That's depression. That's just the hopelessness of all hopelessness. I'm alone. I've been disconnected. And guess what happens when we get disconnected and alone? And this can just be for an area of our hearts. This doesn't even have to be for our whole life. Once it's alone, once it's not connected to the body, it's destroyed. Destruction comes. The enemy comes like a lion to steal, kill, and destroy. And when he finds a little lamb with a broken, lame leg that can't run with endurance like everybody else, destruction comes right in. And and all of that, it doesn't happen overnight, but all of that starts with a little seed. And that's why the writer of Hebrews is saying, 
to look so carefully at these things because we have to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit. And I'm preaching to myself tonight because there's ways that we can just disconnect ourselves and, and just refuse the voice of the Lord. Because it happens. It's a little voice. You're a little disappointed. Let's talk about that. Let's work that out. Let's pray through that. Let, sometimes it's just, let's worship through that. <laughs> sometimes it's like, you could just worship through that disappointment and come out and be like, you know what, that wasn't so big of a deal. I just, I just praised my way out of it. It doesn't have to be a counseling session with you and God. I think sometimes God is just like, how big am I right now? We can talk about this or you can just start worshiping me and this will all just melt away. But it's, we got to be sensitive in that seed moment and we got to care about it in that moment and not just say, you know what, I'll attend to that a little bit later. Because that thing, before you know it, will grow and before you know it, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy but Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullness. And this is where I want to end in this last growth pattern, kingdom expansion in your heart. How does this happen? Kingdom expansion. It's the same thing. Jesus said the kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's like leaven. It starts to grow and starts to take over. And so we can partner with the Holy Spirit and start cutting off the roots of bitterness and let kingdom expand into our hearts. And as it births in your heart, there's a kingdom birth. It's where Nicodemus says, what must I do to enter the kingdom? And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There's a kingdom birth that happens in our hearts. And all of a sudden, we start to realize that the kingdom is within us. And it starts to grow and the kingdom starts to manifest in our lives. Jesus says that the kingdom is within you. And then kingdom power starts to happen because now we're not just little babies. We're moving into, into kingdom power. And it says when, when, when the kingdom comes upon you, when the demons are cast out, when the blind sees, it says the kingdom has come upon you when the power has been made manifest. And then it starts to sprout in your life. You start to learn kingdom warfare and kingdom prayer. And Jesus said that the kingdom suffers violence. Even since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom has always suffered violence, but he teaches us how to pray. He teaches us, your kingdom come, your will be done. So we start to give over our will through kingdom obedience. And as we move into kingdom obedience, we start to be persecuted because Paul says anybody who tries to live righteously according to the kingdom will be persecuted. And so none of us should be taken aback when somebody speaks falsely about us or accuses us or comes against us. That's told to us right off the bat. That's in the signing of the line. You're following Jesus. Well, no, if you're following Jesus, you're signing up for this. And so we, as we mature, we start to get a proper perspective of kingdom persecution. And then we move into rooted adultness and we start to have kingdom compassion for people. And Jesus was moved by compassion and he healed all and he delivered all. And kingdom compassion grows up into kingdom leadership. Kingdom leadership is servant leadership. It's apostolic leadership when it grows into kingdom expansion. And I'm believing here at the tabernacle and the eagle's wings and this family and this region, God's raising up a generation of sons and daughters who love the Father, even the one who disciplines them, because they don't want to be illegitimate, rebellious children of God. They want to be in right order with God, seeing rehabilitation come to their life so that they can bring people into this kingdom model. They can move uh, bitterness out of their life. They can, they can move uh, the, the, the space for the enemy to come kill, steal, and destroy. And we can actually start to rehabilitate people who are living in fornication, who are trading their birthright for a morsel of food, who are profaning the name of God like Esau, where we're starting to see spiritual maturity rise up in the body of Christ. And we come to the end of Hebrews 12. And it says this, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, how about this? Therefore, since a kingdom is expanding inside of your heart that cannot be shaken, let us have grace 
that we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I want to worship the consuming fire. I want to worship God in a way that's acceptable and with reverence and honor and respect and godly fear. I want to worship a, a God, a consuming fire, in the way that I know that he's pleased with me, that my worship is a pleasing sacrifice to him, that the kingdom is expanding within my heart, and as everything is being shaken, listen, nothing, I, I think it says God, yeah, don't, re, uh, let's go back to verse 25. Don't refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from the one who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now his promise saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of all things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's that picture of being forcefully dislocated, right? Guys, God is shaking everything right now. It's not the UN. It's not the Nate. God is shaking the world. And, he, and he's shaking the world in hopes that there's people who are allowing the kingdom and yielding to the kingdom to come into their hearts so that the kingdom which cannot be shaken is expanding inside of their hearts so that as God shakes, there's a people in the kingdom who cannot be shaken. He's looking for that. And we can be people that not only save ourselves from that shaking by letting the kingdom expand, but we can become those apostolic, back to the kingdom expansion gr growth model, if we move into that rootedness and move into that maturity and allow kingdom compassion and kingdom leadership to happen, kingdom apostolic expansion to happen, then we can become disciples like the, like the 12 and we can disciple nations and see kingdom expanded into people and, and, and set apart people like Noah set apart animals where we can literally rescue people from the shaking that is happening. We can, we're not call, called to change the world. We can literally save the world through this model. And it, all it starts with is carefully looking at our lives. It's that simple. Is that crazy? It's that simple. And, and sometimes I forget how simple it is. And if you forgot how simple it was, tonight I want to pray for you. This is, this is the end of it. And I don't know what you're getting out of this. I, I can go in a lot of different directions. Maybe... We can try two or three different things. Maybe the Lord's convicting you of some sin that you haven't been sensitive to, that he's disciplining you in, and it's not a condemnation message. This isn't a condemnation message. God loves to rehabilitate his sons and daughters to bring them into greater relationship and kingdom expansion in their life so that he doesn't have to punish us. Like, that's, that's what he wants to do. So if you're feeling that prick, it's not a bad girl, bad boy thing. It's like, yes. You're my son. You're my daughter. Let's do this together. Let's rehabilitate this. We can see this thing healed so that you can walk and run. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Maybe you're feeling like you've inadequately been able to help other people through this kingdom expansion and you're feeling that maturing process happen in your life and you want to move into that rootedness so that compassion and leadership and expansion is happening in your life. I believe that there's an anointing on this house and for anybody that wants it to move into that apostolic leadership so that we can restore people who are walking away from the Lord and being killed, steal, stolen, and destroyed and we can help rescue them into God's expanding kingdom. I want to pray for both of you tonight. If that's you, you can come to these altars. You can um, stand at your seats, whatever it is. I'm not going to do one or the other. I'm just going to pray for you and just believe that the Holy Spirit is doing what he does best. He's disciplining and rehabilitating and training and initiating us. He is the author and the perfecter. He starts it and he finishes it. He wrote your playbook and he's going to teach you how to run it at the same time. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're cleaning the house, that judgment starts in the house of God. And I thank you that you're bringing purity and righteousness to our lives because you desire 
that we would see you clearly, that we would be in deeper relationship with you, that our, our relationships would thrive on earth and our relationship in heaven with you would thrive. Father, we're asking for a breakthrough of purity in the church. In our lives, Father, start with us. Uproot any disappointment, Lord, any disobedience, any disconnection from the body, Lord. We ask you to integrate us back together. Make us integrity, people of integrity, Father, that our words and our actions would line up together. Father, we open ourselves to the voice of God again. When we were refusing your voice, we turn and repent tonight. And we say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Come and direct us and lead us in the way that we should go. Teach us how to resist temptation, how to run from temptation. We thank you that there is always a way of escape, and it's your voice leading us away from temptation in any given moment. Father, sensitize us to that tonight. I pray for purity to just move through the house move through our homes father in Jesus name a greater level of righteous purity a standard father expose darkness Lord even expose things that we don't know that are happening God that we may rehabilitate and and, and restore ourselves and restore people into greater relationship with you father I thank you for each person that there's no condemnation that if their hearts condemn them your heart is even greater and that only the blood of Jesus can relieve our hearts from condemnation. Father, I pray for the blood to speak over our hearts a better word than the word of condemnation. Come, Holy Spirit, sanctify your people. Now, Lord, for each leader in the room, Father, looking for apostolic expansion in their leadership, for compassion and for discipleship, intergenerational discipleship. Father, I pray for an anointing like no other. Father, that we would be able to disciple people in a culture of honor, that we would be able to discipline sin issues, that we'd be able to restore people back to relationship with each other and relationship with you. Father, that our only option wouldn't be to just cut people off or to cut saints off, but we would actually be able to be gifted to spiritually restore them back into spiritual life and energy, that the twinkle of their eye, the salvation, the, that the, that the, the Spirit would be renewed in them, Father, that we would be able to help facilitate what David prayed, renew a right spirit within me. Father, when people have fallen, given us, give us skills to lift them up again and to restore the lame, Father, that we could all run with endurance, run the race that is before us. Lord, we tonight take up the mandate to build straight roads. We take up the mandate to carefully look at our lives. We take up the mandate, the weightiness that comes with hearing the voice of God, the responsibility that comes with hearing the voice of God. We thank you for the privileges. We thank you for the access. We thank you for the rights that we have. But we take the responsibility that comes with those gifts, that comes with those rights, that comes with that access we take on responsibility to mother and father and orphan generation of people of all ages that don't know how to relate to you, Father. Help us. Help us spiritually lead people into relationship and health with you. Lord, we thank you that you're unstoppable, you're unshakable, you're unmovable. It's who you are. And the kingdom that cannot be shaken is expanding here in our hearts and here in the tabernacle. We declare it and decree it. In Jesus' name, if you said amen, do something. Come on. I love you guys. Thanks for letting me preach that burden off. I'm really believing that um, Bishop Reed, you know, is talking about all these different people with all different backgrounds coming into the church. And I get excited about that, and I get really, really concerned that we might not be ready to relate to these people. We might not be careful enough that in our own lives, falling from the grace, how are we going to offer people answers to the issues that we're facing of identity disorders and and, and perverse living and addictive patterns and, and mental illness and physical illness. How, what are we going to offer people 
And that's what I'm concerned about. I know we have something to offer, but I, I'm believing that God's going to take us to a greater level of authority and communication and clarity and example and model and incarnation so that we really can offer it. We're not offering ideas like we can really offer something. Not Ideas I don't have, but what I have, I offer to you. I have the power to offer to you and get up and walk. Like that level of authority I'm believing for, not just in the pulpit ministers, but in the body of Christ that we're equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. Not just that some select rock stars get to do it, but that we have the authority and the maturity as the bride and as the church and as the family to do this. Are you get what I'm, what I'm picturing? And so I'm believing for this harvest, but I'm saying, God, as quickly as that harvest is coming, please raise us up just as quickly. Lord, mature us now because the days of the game is over. The game's over, folks. There's no more games when life and death is on the line, when everything's being shaken, we can't play games. We got to offer somebody something that cannot be shaken. And I'm looking at people that I believe want that and are doing that and are going to do that to the greatest levels that we've ever seen in any generation. Amen? I'm talking to all of you. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what age you're at. It doesn't matter if you're 12 years old, 10 years old, or 91 years old. I don't, it doesn't matter. The ancient one, the spirit, the ancient of days, the alpha and the omega, the one who's seen everything under the sun, the one who's dealt with humanity all throughout the history of humanity, who knows us and created us, can give us wisdom at any age to start being a change agent, to start being salt and light, to start being disciples, leaders, I love you guys. God bless you. What do we do? Let's go do it. Let's go do it. If you want to pray, I'll pray for you tonight. If you just believe in that you need like agreement, we got Sue and some other prayer warriors up here. If you just need agreement, maybe something, I really feel like there was some Holy Spirit conviction of sin tonight. If you just feel like you need agreement, you know, God says confess your sins and you will be forgiven. Confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. So maybe you're walking in forgiveness, but you're not walking in that, that wholeness and that healedness because it's still disjointed and it's still out of joy. And we want to pray for you for healing over those issues too, not just forgiveness, but that there would actually be transformation and healing so that you can walk out of those places and not just walk back into those places. So we'll be up here praying for you. Uh, we're going to put some music on in the back, and we'll see you this week. whole bunch of amazing things happening here on campuses and home groups, different stuff. Make sure you're getting involved. God bless you.